So hello everyone and welcome on behalf of the Harvard Law School Library. Um, today's book talk and celebration for the recent release of Justice and Leadership in Early Islamic Courts, this, and this is the seventh edition in the Harvard series in Islamic Law. And I believe this is the first release, right? Yes. So, so we do have copies in the back here for the, for, for the Koopas here to sell them, and I suggest that you come and visit the table after the talk, and the authors, uh, the editors are here to actually um, sign books after the, after the close of the talk. We, this is a very special talk today because we have a number of different co-sponsors um, sponsoring this talk today with the Harvard Law School Library. We have the Harvard Law School International Legal Studies Program, the Islamic Legal Studies Program at Harvard Law School, the Harvard University Department of History, the Al-Walid Islamic Studies Program at Harvard University, and the Harvard Muslim Law Students Association. There's a record number of co-sponsors for our talk, so welcome and I'm so happy to see you all here. And I just have one final reminder before Aslahan and, uh, introduces our speakers, and is that I've told you that the coop is here, and also just to let you know that today's talk is going to be recorded, and um, the talk will be released on the Harvard Law School YouTube channel in about two weeks. So any of the questions um, that you might present to the panelists during the question and answer session will be recorded. And without further ado, I will lend the mic to Aslahan. Hi everyone. Um, today's book talk is being held in honor of Roy Mutahade. Uh, joining us today as panelists, we have the book's editors, uh, Professor Intizar Rob. He, she's a professor of law at Harvard Law School, the director of the Islamic Legal Studies Program at Harvard Law <coughs> School, and also the Susan S. and Kenneth L. Wallach Professor at the Harvard University Radcliffe Institute for advanced study and professor of history in the Harvard University Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And professor and with Professor Rob is her co-editor, Abigail Krasner Balbale, assistant professor of the cultural history of the Islamic world at Bard Graduate Center. Also joining the panel are today's special guests, William A. Graham, Murray A. Albertson, professor of Middle Eastern Studies, and University Distinguished Service Professor and also director of the Prince Al-Walid bin Talal Islamic Studies Program at Harvard University. Um, Jemal Kafadar, uh, Vehbi Coach Professor of Turkish Studies, Harvard University Department of History. And Ahmed Al-Shamsi, Senior Visiting Fellow, Harvard Law School Islamic Legal Studies Program, Sharia Source, and Associate Professor of Islamic Thought in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. So without further ado, I will turn it over to the panel. So welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for coming. There's standing room only, which is a great honor for, uh, for all of us and for uh, Professor Motahide. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the, uh, some of the contributions or some of the folks that made contributions here. Uh, Hussein Modarisi helped uh, co-author the introduction. Jamal Kafadar, Ahmed Shamsi, and Bill Granara are here as, okay. I'm sorry, Bill Graham, are here as uh, authors. Uh, so they simultaneously contributed to the panel and uh, have agreed to be here to share some of their thoughts about uh, their work and the life uh, and legacy um, of Roy Motahide as far as it uh, contributes to the field. Uh, there are staff members that work with the Islamic Legal Studies Program, Sharon Tai and Ashley Davis, who contributed enormously to the book, as well as some students, uh, Yusuf Lenfes, Ari Schreiber, uh, and others who helped with the research assistance that went into the book. Um, and we're grateful to June Casey uh, for sponsoring the talk along with the other co-sponsors and to Aslahan um, for doing the introduction today. The book is basically about one thing. It follows a theme on the social, it, of social history from legal and other sources. 
Um, the idea is to understand a variety of practices surrounding ideas of justice and leadership in early Islamic societies as they were employed by historical actors. And this theme was inspired by the approach of Roy Parviz Motahide. So the volume itself grows out of a conference we convened here at Harvard Law School in May 2016 uh, in honor of Roy, um, focused on judicial procedure. All of the chapters of this book grew from presentations at that conference, and um, together they map out new approaches to the history of the Islamic world and to legal history more generally. The volume broadens the sources and areas of focus for uh, a history of Islamic law to include evidence of how courts function and why they worked in the ways that they did. And this often requires incorporating extra legal sources and using legal sources in new ways to address new questions. This book and this conference and now this event are all in honor of Roy, but this is not a traditional festrift. Um, Roy was resistant to the idea of a traditional festrift, both because of his famous modesty, um, but also because he found that too many festrifts were um, hodgepodges of different kinds of, of chapters that didn't hang together as a coherent whole and that didn't make a contribution to the field. And he said, I don't want you all to put together a series of articles by my former students that have nothing to do with each other that nobody will ever read. So we didn't. Instead, we did something um, not conventional, uh, which is to have a coherent uh, theme or approach throughout the, throughout the book and to bring together people who were not all his students but who shared uh, an appreciation for his kind of approach. Um, and so this all draws on Roy's groundbreaking models um, uh, in his work. Um, his books, um, especially Loyalty and Leadership in an Early Islamic Society, which was published in 1980, drew on a variety of different kinds of historical sources to answer broad questions about how societies and governments functioned in the Islamic past. And um, one of the reasons that this was so groundbreaking is that he was applying questions drawn from new social history to sources that had previously um, been seen as um, more uh, offering a narrower perspective on the past. He showed how you could use uh, chronicles, historical chronicles, alongside literary sources and mirrors for princes and all different kinds of sources to get at how people, how society functioned, how um, people interacted with each other, what the bonds that connected people were. And um, it's with that model that this book was, um, was inspired and, um, and that all of the articles um, uh, um, see as um, the, the they, they all follow this vanguard that he set forth over the last um, several decades of his career. And so with that same uh, idea in mind, we'd like to ask the three panelists here to speak to three things. The broad state of the field of Islamic studies and Islamic history or legal history at Harvard and beyond, uh, the use of new sources or old sources in new ways, um, to get at the intellectual, social, uh, and legal history, perhaps in their own contributions to the volume or their own work, uh, and to reflect a bit on uh, Roy's contributions and his use of legal sources for social history or extra legal sources uh, for legal history uh, and efforts at building up the field um, of Islamic studies and Islamic uh, history at Harvard. So uh, with that, we'd like to turn it over to the panelists who have already been introduced, um, who can speak in sort of order of proximity and distance from us, uh, Jamal, then Ahmed, and then Bill. Chronologically, I think we've ordered it we, the other we've way. We've ordered it the other way. Okay, yeah, so we can, yeah. that's fine too. So we then we can start with defend. Bill. Uh, and then we'll just ask them to speak for about five to seven minutes each, and hopefully we'll have a bit of time for discussion after. Thank you. Although I'm certainly the oldest, it was not chronological by age, but, uh, <laughs> but by what we're talking about. Uh, we did have brief uh, 
uh, consultation. Uh, and whether we'll answer your three questions, I'm not certain, but uh, we're going to at least cut, or cut back and forth across them, I think. Um, in thinking about Islamic studies, particularly at Harvard, uh, there would be a huge number of things that could be said. And in five to seven minutes, it's not possible to say many of them. Um, but Harvard does have a reasonably long tradition, but uh, I would say not a uh, focused and distinguished one, uh, probably before the middle of the 20th century, uh, even though going back into the 19th century, Arabic and Islamic topics were being taught here. Um, so let me just mention, uh, <coughs> we have a number of scholars. Uh, we can say Rahimahullah, uh, because um, they are all deceased at this point, but whose names I would just at least like to mention, because I think they are, Roy in particular, his forebears uh, here uh, in Islamic studies. Uh, and that would go back to James Richard Jewett and William Thompson, uh, who was a Jewett, one of the Jewett, one of the early, was perhaps the first Jewett professor. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the giant uh, of, uh, of Arabic and Islamic studies, H.A.R. Gibb, who was also uh, Roy Motaheda's uh, teacher uh, in the late in, in the uh, late 50s uh, and early 60s, when Roy was here as a an undergraduate and then a graduate student. Um, following Gibb, George Mactesy was here. Uh, later moved to Pennsylvania in the late 60s. Wilfred Campbell Smith was here well, with a five-year hiatus for about 25 years. Um, Oleg Grabar in history of art and architecture, who was also a fine Islamic studies historian. Uh, was here for a period of some 30, 35 years. Uh, Mohsen Mahdi from 1968 uh, 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 until uh, his retirement in the 1990s. Uh, Wolfhard Heinrichs, who came <coughs> at the end of the 1970s uh, and was our colleague for a number of years until his death three and a half years ago. Uh, and uh, Anna Marie Schimmel uh, as well, who came uh, in the late 60s uh, and stayed uh, until the early 90s. And was still certainly active uh, at her death in, I believe, 2001. Um, all of these are names that certainly should be invoked, I think, when one thinks about uh, the more recent history of Islamic studies at Harvard. But I think it's really Roy's return, if you like, having been here as a student and as a junior fellow, he returned uh, to Harvard in 1986. Um, and certainly at the time, it, it marked for me and my other colleagues in Islamic studies here uh, a major step forward and certainly the possibility of the blossoming uh, of Islamic studies uh, at Harvard. Uh, and, uh, and then following Roy, of course, Jamal Kafadar, my colleague here at the table. Uh, and in Arabic uh, history, of course, in, in Middle Eastern history, uh, Roger Owen, uh, who was a huge support for Islamic studies because of the modern history teaching, which we had so long had very little of. We had had brief times with everyone from Richard Bulliet uh, to uh, Thomas Philip uh, and others who were, were teaching in the history department. But until Roy's arrival, we really did not have a senior person in the history department for a period of roughly 20 years. And I think that was a great loss for everyone, the students and faculty, uh, in the 1970s uh, and 80s. Uh, and I think here, uh, and, and certainly beginning with Roy's arrival and then through the 1990s with the arrival of others um, who, uh, who were brought in, uh, some of whom I've already mentioned, uh, Islamic studies really becomes a field that Harvard could support from a variety of departments uh, and entities here. Uh, I think Roy, uh, in my view, was always at the center of this. Um, and whether at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies as director in the late 80s, uh, or later uh, taking over, over as the first director of the Al-Walid Center uh, after we received the gift for Islamic studies in 2005, and Roy took over in 2007, um, it's been clear that Islamic studies uh, has revolved around and been, I think, uh, maybe chiefly supported by the work that Roy has done both with students and in his own publications. Uh, and I expect that work is known uh, to most people uh, here in the room. Um, I think it was particularly crucial uh, that he be there in the history department, and it was his appointment that really enabled, I think, us to bring to the history department both Jamal Kafadar and Roger Owen. Uh, we now, uh, sadly, with Roy's retirement and Roger's uh, departure, we are uh, in deficit in the history department, and I think all of us are very keen uh, 
uh, to see a new appointment made this year uh, for uh, modern, uh, for I'm sorry, for medieval history, and uh, and then hopefully following that one for modern history because we feel those are at the at the core of what is is needed uh, in Islamic studies here. Um, let me just now just turn in my last half of my time and just say a few words, however, about Roy and Islamic studies um, and his influence uh, in this area. I have, have, I don't think I've ever told Roy this, but I think in odd ways, I've, I've often thought that Roy is taking the kind of scope of vision that a man named Metz uh, long ago, uh, nearly 100 years ago, took in a book, The Renaissance des Islams, uh, that was later translated into English. Uh, and in this book, where he's looking really uh, at 9th century Baghdad, um, employs an approach that tries to be, in the 1920s, uh, that tries to be, in, in a way, multidisciplinary, to look at a variety of different aspects of culture and uh, government and, and politics and uh, uh, social and economic history uh, and tries to do with that the same sort of thing that Gibb would try in several of the thing, of articles and things that Gibb wrote, but that I think we only see really come to fruition in Roy's work and the work now of many other Islamicists, I think many of whom have been influenced by Roy's work, and that is work that, um, <clears throat> that involves a broad range of sources uh, and, of course, a broad range of questions as well. I think this is easily seen in almost any of his publications, but certainly when you put them all together, it is quite striking. He has always made a constant effort to write history as a human story that's never only about one sector of human life. So certainly I would say that Roy has been a social historian, but he's also been a religious historian, uh, a political historian, uh, even an economic historian at certain moments, uh, but certainly an historian uh, of literature and culture and even art uh, as, and coinage for that matter, as well uh, as a general social historian. And in fact, I think he could only be such a great social historian because of this wide range of interests and of particular subjects that he addressed in his many articles and his two major books. Um, <clears throat> this kind of of broader human story that, uh, that, uh, that really refuses to look only at one sector of life has to uh, combine personal values, it has to take in communal norms, differing political views, changing administrative practice and bureaucracies as well, uh, legal theory and its practice, and that of course is amply illustrated I think in the, uh, in the volume that we're celebrating uh, also today in Roy's honor. Um, but also popular and folk understandings and legends, something that Roy's always had an interest in, whether his work on Ajaib or his work on the Solomon legend, uh, many wonderful things out of which he manages to pull uh, issues of, uh, of import for social, uh, for social history in particular. Um, he was always ready to look at religious ideas and movements and practices. Uh, is very adept as much in the tafsir literature as he is in the geographical and historical literature. Uh, he also is always looking at plural religious and ethnic realities in the periods and in the situations that he studied, as well as, of course, his abiding interest in systems of education and how people, not just in the madrasas, but in Islamic society as a whole, are educated to be Muslims, if you like, of whatever variety they may be. He also, of course, had a constant interest in social control and political power. And without that interest, I think the others would have been less, much less, the study of the others would have been much less powerful. Uh, his diverse essays into Islamic social history, I think, offer his students and his colleagues, not to mention the wider global field of Islamic studies, a diverse series of ventures aimed at elucidating the complexities as well as the red threads, if you like, of Islamic societies and the lives of those who formed those societies. This is certainly not a small matter. And both the book in view today and this gathering, I think, offer at least some testimony to that. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure here to 
uh, speak about um, my um, supervisor, Remo Tahre, who uh, welcomed me here um, twice, uh, uh, virtually in 2002 when I got accepted, um, and then 2003 after a torturous year of waiting for my visa. You remember that something happened early 2000s. Uh, um, uh, and so I, um, when I was thinking about what to talk about today, uh, the first point that came to my mind is uh, really h how influential Roy's work was in uh, uh, steering my path towards uh, doing a PhD in um, in the history of the Mi of, of the Middle East. Um, I remember in college at, at SOAS in London in the late 90s um, this very strange feeling when when I when I looked at studies on the Middle East that I really liked the headlines. Uh, the titles of the works, but then when I got into the actual works, they bored me, or they uh, kind of they very often they were simply about texts, about understanding texts uh, in a way that I didn't find particularly interesting. And and what I uh, enjoyed so immensely about uh, Roy's work was that he was looking at human beings through the texts. So he was clearly somebody in control of those texts, uh, who had the philological training. Um, but um, his writings are not about those texts, they're about the people that, are, that we can experience in these texts. And that is really something that, is, um, uh, that one can see both on the, um, uh, on the level of content, but also on the formal level. Um, if you look at his um, articles or his works, they have very little footnotes. Uh, they have uh, 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 very condensed footnotes, uh, this is not meant to be a <laughs> <laughs> underhanded <laughs> <laughs> criticism. Um, but th they, are, they are texts that you can read uh, and that you can actually, that, that actually are prose writings uh, rather than strings of footnotes strung together by, uh, by sentences. Uh, so that is really something that I, um, uh, I, find, I found uh, um, revolutionary uh, still in the, in, the, in the 1990s. Um, now, when when I was invited to this year, um, I thought, well, uh, what, is, what exactly is the meaning of, of these kind of academic uh, gatherings in which we celebrate um, colleagues that are um, leaving active academia? Um, uh, I think that's, that's a question that as a historian or as a s social historian is, is also worth asking. You know, what exactly are we trying to achieve? Uh, is this some sort of Freudian reenactment of some sort of Oedipal tensions, uh, you know, goodbye, now the field is ours. Um, <laughs> I don't, I mean, who knows? That's not <laughs> what I want to talk about today. Um, but, but part of the issue, I think, is um, that it's also worth thinking about, um, not necessarily about the sugary sweet memories uh, uh, that, are really, that, are, that, that we associate with, with uh, Roy as somebody who, uh, who, me who mentored students and who uh, introduced us to the treasures of, of the pre-modern uh, Middle East, but maybe also about failures. And I'm, I'm not talking about personal failures, but um, failures about the project of pre-modern uh, Middle Eastern history. Um, so uh, Harvard seems to have been, uh, I'm not a great historian of the field, but uh, really a source of pre-modern uh, uh, Middle Eastern history, uh, both Roy Motahade, Richard Bullitt, uh, two really leading lights in, uh, in the second half of the 20th century in the United States. But the, the question that I very often ask myself is, uh, why did this m uh, movement actually remain relatively limited uh, in terms of its spread to other universities, uh, to, uh, to academia as a whole? Um, I myself, after I left here uh, with a PhD in history and Middle Eastern studies, uh, first went uh, to a, um, um, uh, the University, University of North Carolina where I was uh, in the history department. Uh, I was uh, a source of assistant professor for North African history, which they really hadn't thought about when they uh, put together that position. Uh, there is no North African history in the United States, really. Um, uh, but then afterwards, I moved to the University of Chicago to a, an, an elk department, to a um, um, uh, area department, and this is uh, something that has uh, remained in place. Uh, a, um, Sheldon Pollock talks about this quite uh, eloquently, uh, that um, um, the, the non-Western world 
I mean, even I mean, whether it's history, philology, other other types of studies of literature, um, have kind of not just remained, but in a, in a sense, in, in recent decades, kind of re uh, been reestablished as places where people who study the non-Western, particularly the pre-modern non-Western world, have been con confined to, um, and. Um, um, this is something that uh, uh, is quite interesting, given that after 9-11 there was such a renewed interest in the, uh, in the Muslim world. But uh, on the kind of academic level, much of this actually has resulted in a really explosive growth on the level of religious studies, uh, uh, not so much on the level of, uh, of history. Uh, and, um, you know, the AR has just been finished uh, here in, in Boston. Uh, I have to say there is relatively little history in the in religious studies um, uh, of Islam, I think particularly in the religious studies uh, of Islam, um, and uh, that's something I, I find rather um, uh, disappointing. There is a almost a, a phobia of, um, um, I mean, somebody like me was always considered to be a philologist um, uh, rather than asking questions that uh, uh, that are more theoretical. Uh, in the sense that that is understood in, in relig religious studies, uh, so um, um, I have no worked out uh, answer to this. But uh, one of the things I want to um, uh, I want to support uh, Bill Graham here in, in, in what he said earlier is that uh, I think it's really important to maintain places where um, the history of the pre-modern Middle East is actually taught in a history department um, in conversation with uh, with historical methods in conversation with uh, with historians. Uh, and I think that's something that is uh, that um, places like 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 Harvard really need to maintain. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> it, it's a privilege, really, to be <laughs> speaking to this audience, but particularly in front of Roy and about Roy. I had this opportunity a couple of times before, and I appreciate each one for reasons I will try to explain, and I already uh, formulated some of the reasons why Roy has been so important, so influential in the field here at Harvard and beyond, and in my own work uh, in the book that's just published. I'll say very little on the institutional front that uh, Bill and Ahmed already went over, but just a couple of points. The situation, I think, is not as bleak in pre-modern studies if one looks at Ottoman history mm -hmm. as a growing, flourishing field in mostly history departments throughout North America and elsewhere, actually. And in that, too, I believe Roy has something to do, even though it's much more indirect, perhaps, it is still important to take into account. But unfortunately, as Bill already indicated, in the history department at Harvard itself, the situation is not uh, <laughs> very good at this moment, to use an understatement. We're down to one position out of three robust fields nurturing one another for, for two decades and training students in that fashion. This year we have a search in modern Middle East history in reverse order, Bill, I think. I, I don't know how you indicate This year we have modern Middle East history and we're hoping to have a medieval history search at some point, but then it, it's not as easy as it used to be to get approvals for searches at University Hall, which is another big problem. But it just has to be done, I know, and I, uh, uh, many of us are trying to do our best to make that happen. Uh, as for turning, uh, turning my attention to uh, Roy's contribution on the intellectual plane to the field of pre-modern Islamic studies in general and to Ottoman studies in particular, I highlighted in the very brief essay I contributed to the book my experience of reading with Roy when we co-taught courses on Seljuk history on three occasions, I was very fortunate, when we read medieval sources from, from Iran and Anatolia on the Seljuks of Iran and Anatolia respectively, obviously. And there I noticed and enjoyed and learned a lot from Roy's reading 
along the grain and against the grain, making much of the materials and extracting things that I or anyone reading the same materials had been unable to see in those very texts. But at the same time, what was really refreshing to me co-reading with Roy or following his reading was how he could at the same time not be captivated by a kind of overdone loyalty to the source, by, a, by an overdone respect for the source. There came a moment after a very, very rigorous reading of something where he saw a phenomenally profound uh, aspect in the material, in the text. He would turn to the next sentence and then point out how much of a cliche, how much of a uh, platitude it was. And that kind of give and take in our exchange with texts was very regular. And that was a very good experience which I did go over in that uh, material, but uh, in that essay. So that was a great pleasure, learning to read with Roy in that fashion, but reading him came much before than reading with him, namely reading Roy's works themselves, which I didn't have much of an opportunity to, to develop in this essay, and I want to just say a couple of words on that. Very briefly, in the early 1980s, when I first encountered loyalty and leadership, Roy's first, and uh, to me still unsurpassed, great, wonderful book, uh, opened our, it opened our eyes to the possibilities of reading pre-modern texts, non-philosophical, non-theological texts, texts like chronicles, geographies, tales of wonder, for ideas. Ideas, one would say at that time. I had many colleagues really approaching those texts, be they medieval Islamic or Ottoman in that fashion. Ideas in the chronicles? <laughs> come, come. And I'm not just talking, looking for attitudes and mentalities, which he also did. And remember, the uh, history of mentalities itself was an innovation in the 1980s, often italicized, mentalité. And that's another thing that reading Roy carefully and being in, with him and spending time with him, one notices Roy never gives in to trendiness. And in fact, teaches you that it, 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 it really is the thing to be avoided if one wants to be the one setting trends, especially. And that is precisely what he kept doing. Uh, through these uh, hermeneutic exercises, which I'm just trying to describe. So it's not just attitudes and mentalities, which itself would have been innovative enough for that period, but really for ideas, for concepts, categories, and modes of analysis that he read those medieval sources, which hardly anyone did at that time, and hardly anyone is a cautious statement. Um, he read them for their concepts, categories, and modes of analysis, and for ideas regarding social structures and processes, for instance, which was totally unusual. You read a 12th, 11th, 12th century source for understanding <coughs> the social structures of 11th, 12th century society. That was impossible at that time. And here was something very original that opened our eyes, really. And it was a profoundly non-Orientalist approach, not necessarily anti-Orientalist. I don't know if you, anyone here recalls the very uh, sharp and bitter uh, uh, setting of those, of those uh, days in the early 1980s when Orientalism was uh, discussed, and for good reason. But Roy's approach was distinctly non-Orientalist, in my opinion. That's how we read it from our field, especially in Ottoman history. If one considers that Orientalism and the scholarly traditions based on it did not find much that was worth taking seriously in pre-modern chronicles, other than facts, lies, and cliches, exaggerations, platitudes, those too, Roy, of course, as I indicated already, was able to see. But there was something way beyond it, and then I would characterize it as the ultimate humanistic approach to texts which was missing in the field. Colleagues already indicated how texts for Roy was 
ultimately the venue to understand human beings. And in that sense, I would consider that the ultimate humanistic approach to human beings and the meanings they assigned to the world and to their place in the world and to their predicaments and to their deeds in the world. And that one could capture through their own discourses, be they in tales of wonder, be they in chronicles, in geographies. And one could use the concepts and categories used in those texts to understand social structures and social processes. And that, in fact, is what loyalty and leadership proved to us already in the early 1980s. And uh, thereafter, this kind of influence is hardly noted. But a new approach to texts was emerging, not really simply in medieval Islamic studies, in Ottoman studies, in modern Middle Eastern studies to some degree, to a lesser degree, I'm afraid, uh, in the fields like Mughal and Safavid studies, speaking with colleagues with whom I share a lot because of our early modern focus, so on and so forth. So that is something uh, crucial that ought to be underlined. In one sentence, I'd just say that he, en he enabled us to a new kind of reading of our sources and thus to a new kind of social and cultural history. Thank you. Should we go back up or should we just stay here? Okay, so um, we've heard from our esteemed panelists uh, what an outsized influence Roy Parviz Motahida has had on the field both here at Harvard, where he's helped build the institutions that have co-sponsored this event, um, and the departments and the centers, and beyond. He's trained in his 26 years of teaching, um, both here at Harvard and, uh, sorry, 46 years of teaching here at Harvard and at Princeton before. Um, he's trained hundreds of students um, in looking at sources uh, with the, philologi the philologists, um, ability to read and a social historian set of broad questions. And um, he's trained people who have filled the, the positions not just in history departments, but across religion departments and, and area studies departments um, who are now teaching these, these skills and these approaches to new generations of students. Um, and you'll see if you look at this book that um, it's full of people doing exactly that, uh, reading sources against the grain, um, thinking about broad questions, using new sources uh, to ask old, to answer old questions in new ways, using old sources in new ways to answer new questions, um, thinking about how power, judicial practice, um, courts functioned, not just the ideal model of the state or the court, um, and and thinking about them as people operating um, in a society that changes and shifts and, um, and thinking about the flexibility of these practices and the flexibilities uh, of, these, um, of these structures over time as opposed to sort of ossified, um, stuck structures that, uh, that may be presented in, in some sources. So we have a, a number of articles. I encourage you all to look at um, the book in the back and to look at the variety of approaches and sources that people have used in the book. Um, they include using literary sources, uh, chronicles, uh, books of um, legal literature, um, and uh, um, mirrors for princes, a whole variety of sources. Um, to answer questions about how courts functioned, how people associated with the courts functioned, and why they functioned the way that they did. Um, so we want to leave some time for you all to ask us and the panelists questions. Um, but I, I wanted to, to close my part by thanking Roy, who is also my uh, advisor, for the inspiration and mentorship he's offered so many of us um, as a teacher, as an advisor, as a mentor, as a colleague, as a friend, um, and, uh, and thank him for, for the, the work that he's done to build this field over the course of the last 50 years, um, both at Harvard and beyond. And in closing, we have, we have one more quote from a friend of um, 
of Roy's, a longtime friend and collaborator who uh, co-wrote the introduction with us, Hussein Madarasi. And uh, just before I read that, I also just want to chime in with my thanks as well to Roy for being a teacher, a mentor, a colleague, and a friend, and someone who really uh, helped me uh, navigate the sources even as a student, even though I was never a formal student of Roy. Uh, I was in touch with him when I was a student from Princeton, and I remember he gave me some of the best advice that, uh, that really uh, sort of shaped how I looked at my time at Princeton, that this was a great opportunity to sit and read the sources and to read it in this broad-minded way that he exhibited in his own work, and to do so uh, at, the, at the institution um, where I was um, under the tutelage of scholars um, like himself and like this colleague, Hossein Wadarasi. So he said, uh, he summed, Hossein Wadarasi summed up Roy the man and the method in this way. It may appear odd to say, but Roy was in a way like Sharia. The jurists against analogical reasoning used to say that interpretation involves jam al-mutafariqat wa majma al-mutadadat, bringing together varied elements and opposing ideas. Roy was like that. He brought together people who you could not otherwise imagine gathering under the same ceiling. But he was friends with all of them, and they all owed him a debt of gratitude and friendship reflected in their scholarship and good humor whenever it came to Roy. And the, the debt and the, that spirit is reflected in this project and the spirit with which we uh, say thanks to Roy today. Um, so with that, we'd like to open for any questions or comments that you all may have. So if you raise your hand, we can see you. No one wants to know what's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the wrapper is sealed, which is, is, is difficult to look at the back to, to take a look inside. So maybe you could actually talk a little bit about the chapters that are in the book. Yes. Sure. So, so the book is actually a book that has 10 different contributions uh, with nine uh, substantive historical chapters. And, and it's broken down into three uh, parts where each of them looks at a different area of uh, the history of, of courts. Uh, so the first part is called Judicial Procedure and Practice During the Founding Period of Islamic Law, and it's really looking at uh, the time from the rise of Islam in 632 until 750, uh, roughly. So there are four essays there that really ask questions about how law worked, even during this earliest period, uh, drawing from, or at least raising questions, um, even if there can't be absolutely definitive answers about how law worked in individual cases. Um, one of the, the lessons that Roy has taught us is that there are uh, ways of reading the sources to gather, uh, and to gather general ideas and paint a general picture of the ways that law worked and functioned uh, even in, early, in the earliest periods. And so here, the authors who write these essays look at questions of uh, judicial discretion. How did social and practical, pragmatic factors affect how a judge would decide a case one way or the other? So it wasn't always on the basis of law and legal interpretation and looking at texts but it was very much a social enterprise and a pragmatic one. Uh, they look at the role of professional witnesses uh, and how uh, judges, qadis, or uh, legal interpreters as muftis um, strategically deployed uh, the use of evidence uh, in court proceedings. And so uh, four of these essays, um, both uh, 
Ahmed and I have chapters in this part of the book uh, focused on, on these ideas. Do you want to do the next sec sure. section or shall I go? Yeah, so then the next section is called Concepts of Justice in the Abbasid East. It's looking at the next chronological section of, um, uh, well, it's both chronological and geographic because then we move to the Western Islamic world, to uh, North Africa and Al-Andalus in, in the next section. But so this is the, the East, um, the period in which the Abbasids are ruling, and it's looking at how the ideas and concepts laid out in that early period play out in a new polyglot, more diverse, more complex worlds um, under the Abbasids. So the, the chapters in this section look at um, what happens when the witnesses and the plaintiffs and the judge don't all speak the same language. Um, that is, what is the role of a translator in a court and how are they treated according to different um, legal theorists? Uh, how much uh, power do they have in the court? How many of them do they need to be who agree on the same um, translation, should they be treated as witnesses, should they be treated um, as, as uh, representatives of the court, what role do they have. Um, then uh, we have a contribution um, about the idea of justice and uh, of God as a judge, um, looking at um, Quranic exegesis that talks about um, God as judge to try to visualize um, the heavenly court on the Day of Judgment, and, and looks at how ideas about the heavenly court play out in the orientation of physical earthly courts. Um, uh, and then uh, we have a contribution that looks at um, how judges, justice, and law are treated in three different Arabic mirrors for princes from the Abbasid period, uh, thinking about um, uh, how, how ideas of justice shift between the 8th and the 11th century, um, and uh, how authors offering advice to rulers tell them how to appoint judges and, um, and what role the judges should play in their, in their courts. And then the last section, I, uh, as Abby said, moves from the Abbasid East to the, to the Islamic West and we call it judges and judicial practice in the Islamic West. And I'd actually like to uh, talk about that chapter by, uh, or that section by reading the section introduction, <laughs> in part because it's so humorous, uh, that was written by uh, Roy's colleague, Michael Cook. Uh, so he, he puts it this way, uh, Shureh ibn al-Harith al-Kindi, who died around the end of the seventh century, spent several decades sitting in judgment in Kufa. Um, and as a side note, if you look at the, the judicial biographies on judges, any entry of Shureh typically takes up you know, at least a fourth of the work. Um, so one of his cases concerned the marital affairs of a visitor from Damascus, Adi ibn Artat al-Fazari, who died in 102 or 720. The unfortunate Damascene found himself entrapped in the following conversation. Adi, the Damascene, says, where are you? Meaning, where are you at? Are you busy? Do you have a free moment for me? Shureh says, between you and the wall. Adi says, listen to me. Shureh, the judge, speak, I hear you. Adi, I'm a Syrian. Shureh, that's a long way. <laughs> Adi, I took a wife from among you. Shure, happy marriage. <laughs> Adi, I want to take her with me to Damascus. Shure, a man has a stronger right to his wife than her family. Adi, it was made a condition that she should remain in her abode, i.e. Kufa in Iraq. Shure, the, condi the condition prevails. Ashart Amlek. Adi, so now judge between us. Shure, I already did. Adi, who do you give the judgment against? Shure, your mother's son. Adi, on whose testimony? Shure, on the testimony of your maternal aunt's sister's son. 
<laughs> so that's that's the end of the story. But uh, I mean, it's it's humorous, um, and uh, Michael Cook actually says that you know I don't know how much this tells us about actual judicial procedure from that period, and it's a question that he leaves to Roy Matahide. Um, but the anecdote can at least uh, demonstrate for us that there's such a thing as joking judges, which is what one of the contributors in that chapter then writes about, um, instances of uh, judges who, uh, of biographer, biographers who document uh, early judges telling jokes. It wasn't all about uh, uh, writing a history of procedure, but it's also about some of the anecdotes that, that sort of reflect the human aspects of the judges um, in the stories involved. And so uh, there's a great uh, contribution on the joking judges in the Islamic West. And then there was also uh, a contribution in this section about the idea of mutual imprecation or li'an. Um, and, or mutual, mutual cursing. So how exactly did that, uh, how exactly did, it, did the institution come about? Um, what did it really mean? So beyond sort of the doctrines of um, being able to, a husband being able to swear to the adulterous conduct of his wife and vice versa, or her being able to deny it um, and avoid uh, criminal liability. So that's the doctrine. But aside from that, how do we widely and creatively and deeply read the sources to gain an idea of how and why that uh, institution would even have emerged and how it functioned? And so that's what the other contribution to this section does. And so I think all of the contributions to the volume really, uh, as, as we've been, as we laid out at the at outset and have been sort of emphasizing, it's really Roy's method um, of of reading widely and deeply and many different sources and asking many different questions uh, of, of them. I, I'll just add one more thing, which is that in both of those last two examples, it's very clear that what the traditional approach to these questions is, is following what the sources say should be done. So many kinds of legal sources say judges should operate with hilm, with a kind of authority and um, and uh, we translate him like um, self-control, self right? They should not be joking. They should not be making dirty jokes, especially. They should not be doing anything that would make anybody doubt their piety. And what Maribel Fierro does in this article, she shows that in fact, there were lots of jokes, including dirty jokes, being made by sitting judges that it was happening all the time, and that people weren't immediately saying, this disqualifies this judge from being a judge, that in fact there was an enormous variety of practice that was seen as acceptable, and that it's only over time that these kinds of ideas solidify into um, orthodoxy, that in fact there's a really long period uh, until the modern period, as Roy has said in his work on, on jihad, it's not until the 18th and 19th century with uh, European involvement in, in reading Arabic sources that there is, there's an idea that there's a single doctrine of jihad, for example. Um, so there, there's a long, long period of multiple narratives and, and these, these articles explore some of those multiple narratives and illuminate a world that is more varied and more complex than, um, than some of the sources would have us believe. And all of that is really um, inspired by, by Roy's reading against the grain as our panelists suggested. Great, so if there are no questions, there is a question now. You've had time to think. Um, there's a microphone on this side of you. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I have two questions. Uh, one is about the separation of power between executive power and uh, legislative and uh, legal power. Do you see such things, separation between the two, and or if this is uh, unified in the same person of the ruler at the old time, comparing what we today understanding of separation power? And second question goes to the policy implication of your study. Uh, considering the same sources of books and sunnah in even today's Islamic jurisprudence, 
how do you see this precedent and the connection with the past with the today and the policy implication of your study on this issue? Thank you. So I can take the, the first question and maybe leave your, your to whole article is on anyone here the second right, uh, because my contribution to the volume was about uh, ideas of separation of powers or how they might have uh, been exemplified in one case that I look at uh, from uh, the mid eighth century. And it's a case that sort of had a, a history that started uh, long before the point where it made it to court in the year 743 or 744. Um, and it's really a story of a judge that is caught between uh, what he deems to be one outcome that the executive wants to see happen with regard to the disposition of a particular piece of land that was fairly important, it turns out, in early Islamic history. Uh, and uh, his reading of social context um, and, and, of, and perhaps of m moral right or religious context as well. So something maybe between the people and the law as opposed to uh, what the executive wanted to happen. And he really threads the needle uh, in a surprising way, doesn't come out uh, on the side of one or the other but uh, sort of has a, a split decision. But the, the point is that it really uh, exemplifies ways in which judges, uh, judges had to exercise agency over and against other institutions. And I think there's a lot more work to be done uh, to sort of draw the parallels uh, between uh, different institutional powers and separation of powers uh, according to the model, modern legal uh, concepts that we have, but it's, it's certainly there. One person hearing um, or, or having read this, um, this uh, article said, oh, this looks like the Marbury moment of uh, Islamic law, meaning the moment where the, the judge asserts his independence and says, we have the right to say what the law is and we'll do it in the manner that we choose, particularly when there are conflicts between branches. So I don't know if I would go that far and say all of that, but there's the concept is certainly there. Would anyone else like to speak to what they might see as policy implications in the field for a study such as this one? I'll just say I think it's important to recognize that things, answers to questions that we might think are very, very long, um, uh, long-standing answers are in fact recent constructions. But of course there are things that are historically important, but that there were in every field, and I don't think this is just a legal question, I think this is a broader historical one, we tend to look back and imagine that the narrative that gets us to where we are today was direct and coherent. And it wasn't ever. Past is never coherent as it's happening. <laughs> it's complex. It's only our projection backward that makes things coherent. So I think that being aware of the fact that the 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 historical narratives and the legal structures that have come to us today um, were born out of complex and contradictory impulses and trends over time is important. And it offers potential pathways forward. So with, with uh, do, do we have another question? Yes, I just have okay. two brief questions uh, for the panel. Thank you so much for this really beautiful introduction to, uh, uh, to this launch. And my first question is about, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the transformation from the conference to the edited mm -hmm. volume? What were some of the themes that came up? And how, you know, tell us a little bit more about that transformation. And then the second question is, how does this volume, you know, taken as a collective, these essays, how does this, vol how this volume contributes to and perhaps changes the scholarship on early Islamic courts? I did the procedure and you do the change. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so we did this in, I think, maybe record academic conference proceedings time um, <laughs> because Roy uh, retired in 2016 and so we wanted to have this conference in his honor in May 2016. Um, and we got it from conference to 
book on the table in what, 16 months. Um, and in fact, we got it to the press within just about a year, um, which was... Which meant there were pains. There, there were a lot of pains, and there were a lot of people who helped. It wouldn't have been possible without a lot of help from research assistants and copy editors and amazing indexers and all of these, all of these people who worked really, really hard. And, and of course, really, the authors really themselves. Late. And the who authors themselves really who turned too. around, turned yeah. around drafts and um, and different versions in you know a week at a time. It was peer reviewed. We we did that whole process in that in that year as well. Um, and not all of the people who spoke at the conference ended up um, offering contributions to the the volume, um, but the ones they did fell fell very neatly into these three categories that we um, we separated the book into, um, and they still showcased a kind of impressive diversity of sources and approaches um, from the very early Islamic period um, through about the the 12th century. Yeah, and I think the study of uh, early Islamic courts is uh, relatively new. Uh, the person that's written most extensively on it is a European scholar named Mathieu Tillier, and he's just published a new book on the subject in this year, actually, in 2017, and he has another 2009 book uh, on it as well. So there are these um, massive tomes of uh, looking at early uh, judges in Egypt in the first book and then the uh, other regions within the Islamic world in the second book. Um, I don't know that, uh, that his books for non-French speakers have been that accessible and so um, it would be this book um, provides at least an English language accessible um, survey of the uh, types of studies that uh, one could do, or and it reveals some of the interesting questions, really interesting questions, I think, that arise in that time. Um, and I think it's actually a burgeoning area. Um, more and more people I'm hearing are expressing interest uh, in the period, the field, the approaches um, that are taken. So I think it's, it's both about the substance and the methodology that we really try to uh, emphasize here with the, the broad and deep reading of sources. And so it's in those two ways that I think this book makes a contribution to the field. And I hope that it does indeed invite other scholars to uh, work on the area. Is, sure, is there one more question? One more question. Yeah, sorry, uh, it's an honor being here and witnessing all this. Uh, it's truly just very insightful. Uh, I just had like, two like, small questions. Uh, one was the, how were judges, like were they, were there, was there like an overseeing like body of like a ruler or like some power that like was governing the judges in a way or like that oversaw like what the judge's conduct, whether it was deemed fair or unfair, or were they just, did they have free reign over whatever they did? And the other question was, uh, were there, was there like a split between like civil and cr criminal courts or were they all just tied up in one? Uh, would, Ahmed, do you wanna take one of those questions? I don't wanna be the, I, I can speak to it, but I don't wanna be the only one. Uh, okay, so I say something and then you say in what way I'm wrong. <laughs> um, uh, it all depends, right? It's, um, these judges had to be appointed by an authority uh, and somebody had to implement their decisions. Um, so at different stages, you have different degrees of supervision. Um, uh, you have, uh, first of all, the, the actual emergence of judgeship as a separate uh, uh, um, uh, job uh, description. Um, and then, depending on what, what time period you're, you're talking about, um, uh, there, there was always an opportunity to appeal to the ruler, uh, either to have the judge removed or to review a specific decision. Um, but otherwise, that really depends on the, on the social context and, uh, and the political time period you, you're thinking about. Yeah, and I would fully agree with that. I think on the question of uh, civil criminal uh, courts it, or jurisdictions, um, 
in early Islamic history. I mean, it wasn't as we, we now think of two different jurisdictions um, and two different areas of law uh, that, that fall around neatly in terms of civil and criminal law. I do think there was a, something that we could call a body of uh, crimes or criminal law, uh, but then there were multiple jurisdictions that dealt with it. So it could uh, come across the desk, so to speak, of uh, a judge, a, someone that, that was a police, officer or policeman shortly, a uh, market inspector, um, one of the royal caliphal agents, uh, a, an older uh, wise person in town who uh, helped keep things out of the courts. And so there were multiple um, actors that uh, would play a role both in civil and in criminal cases, uh, but that's one of the things that we need to explore more and, and paint a sharper um, image or, or a more textured uh, landscape of, of that very question. So thank you for the question, and thank you all for coming and for all the panelists uh, for being here as well and contributing. Thank you.